So after all these serious talks about really hardcore, heavy subjects, I thought it would be fun to do something simple and lightweight instead. So let's talk about building some really fast data structures in Swift. Uh, in specific, we are going to implement this particular protocol, which is describing an ordered set, which is a collection with comparable elements that also implement set algebra. Uh, one extra semantic detail that we cannot express in the type system is that we want the collection to return elements in the in increasing order based on their comparable implementation. All right. Uh, the problem is that collection is kind of a complicated protocol. It has five associated types and about 30 members. And the set algebra isn't far behind it. Uh, it has about 20 members, but only one associated type. So rather than doing all of them one by one, we are going to do a simplified version of our data structures, which is only going to implement this one protocol. It has three members, an empty initializer for creating an empty set, of implementation of for each to just list all the members, all the elements inside the set, and also a mutating function, insert, that we can use to take an already existing set and insert a new element into it. All right, so that's the protocol we are going to implement throughout this talk. We are going to have many implementations, so buckle up, we will have a lot of source code to cover. First off, uh, we have Foundation, uh, the framework, and it has this really promisingly named class called NS Ordered Set. It kind of implements everything we need, uh, but unfortunately, it isn't intended to be a really uh, general use case for this particular application. But since it does everything we need, we can just wrap it around some kind of class that implements this protocol and have one uh, easy implementation of what we want. Let's look at the performance of NS ordered set under these constraints. So what we are going to look at is uh, the time it takes to do a single insertion on average based on the size of our set, okay? And we are going to use a logarithmic uh, axis on both axes, horizontally and vertically. So every time we go one step to the right, we increase the size of the collection by two times. Uh, and every time we go up uh, one level, we double the execution time. So here is what NS ordered set looks like. Is this fast? Is this slow? Uh, well, we have no idea because we have nothing to compare it against. That sloping upwards at the end isn't really promising, but we cannot really tell if th this is good or not. So let's do another quick implementation of our own in pure Swift this time. Uh, we are going to do a sorted array that implements this ordered set protocol. The idea is that we'll just use an element for uh, an array for element storage, and we will uh, insert elements one by one in their correct place in the array to keep the elements sorted, okay? Like that. Uh, the representation is really rather simple. We just need to uh, create a struct because we want a value type uh, that has a single stored property, which is the array that uh, stores all these elements. And then we can start implementing all the methods. We get the empty initializer for free. For each is also really simple because we can just forward it to the storage array. array. Uh, insertion isn't that difficult, but we have to find the place we want to insert the element in, which can be done with a simple binary search like this. Uh, it is really rather simple. It's not complicated, I hope. Uh, but once we have that, uh, insertion is really trivial because we only have to look at the specific place of this particular value we want to insert. If it's already there, we don't do anything. If it's not, we just call array.insert to insert it in there, in its rightful place. Okay, done. We, are, we have done two implementations already. Uh, let's see how this one performs. Okay, so let's put it on the chart. And uh, that's pretty imp impressive for a while. Uh, it can be about 40 times faster than an assorted set, which is kind of cool. But then it starts growing in a linear way and reaches up to it at about 200,000 elements. And beyond that, it gets even slower. But to be honest, neither of these implementations is really fast. Uh, to get that 200,000 uh, size set, both of them take about four seconds of runtime. So that's not very impressive. What can we do about this? Well, we can open up 
uh, an algorithm book. There are many to choose from, and we can find a description of a data structure called red black trees. Here they are. Uh, kind of impressive, it's a search tree, very colorful, red and black nodes. Uh, the primary invariant inside of it is that whenever we have so some node inside the red black tree, everything below to the left to it uh, has a value that is less than the node's own value, and everything to the right is greater. Okay, so that's ma that makes it easy to search for a particular value inside this tree. All right, uh, well, the tree can be broken up into these two basic building blocks. We have either an empty tree or a non-empty tree that has a parent node or a root node on top of it. The root node can be either black or red. It must have a value, and it has two children, which are trees themselves, either empty or a node. Okay. The representation of it in Swift uh, can be really simple if we are using algebraic data types, uh, also known as enums. Uh, we, ha we have to have two of them. We have to have one for the color and the other for uh, the actual tree representation, which can be either empty or non-empty. All right. In the non-empty case, when we have a node, uh, we have to use this indirect case syntax because the fields of this node value include references to the actual type we are defining, and this just signals to the compiler that we want this case to be boxed into a reference type and allocated on the heap, reference counted, etc. Okay, once we do, do this, uh, we, can, we can start uh, creating red black trees by just using the Swift literal syntax. Okay, so here's an example uh, red black tree, and we can convert it to Swift syntax like this. Uh, it looks kind of scary and opaque, but if you just squint the right way, uh, you can actually detect traces of the original structure inside this literal. So it's kind of cool. <laughs> Thank you. Well, obviously, you don't want to code red black trees like this. Insertion is kind of painful to do it this way. Uh, so instead, let's define some extension methods to implement our protocol. For each is a nice example of the way we usually work with these kinds of algebraic data types. Uh, we break up the problem we want to solve into smaller parts using pattern matching, like a switch statement here. And then we solve each one using the tool of recursion, which is really powerful. So for each simply needs to walk the tree in the order of increasing elements. This is called an in-order walk, and this is the standard algorithm to do so. Insertion. Uh, it's supposed to be a mutating function, but mutations are really hard to express directly with the algebraic data types, so it's much easier to use a functional style of programming. So re let's just replace insertion by this really simple, pure function. It takes an element and returns a brand new tree that includes a couple of every existing element plus this extra element you wanted to insert. Okay. Once we have that, we can do the mutating variant by simply assigning the result of this function to self. That's easy. So here is what insertion looks like. Uh, it's built to the same scheme as for each. Uh, it uses uh, switch statements with better matching and recursion to do its job. We are going to look at uh, these particular methods balanced, which are doing the actual red black tree balancing algorithm. Uh, let's see how, how, how that is supposed to work. Well, we have these four patterns we need to recognize, and if one of them matches our, the top of our tree we are working with, we have to replace, restructure that tree with one that matches the pattern in the middle. So that's all we need to do to rebalance the red back tree after an insertion. Okay, how do we implement this in Swift? Well, we know how to uh, redraw in these diagrams or transcribe them into Swift literal syntax, so let's do that. Really simple, one by one, we just rewrite everything. And blindly, without looking at them, we can just put them one below each other. And you know, we can just press a button in Xcode, and Xcode will just slowly fade in a Swiss statement around them. And that is it. Uh, here we have a red-black tree balancer in just eight lines of Swiss code. Uh, it, really simple, really elegant. It does a very complicated job in our well, rather complicated pattern matching uh, implementation, but compared to something else that we will see soon, this is really quite remarkable. 
So let's see at the performance of our implementation. Uh, red black trees are supposed to have uh, a huge algorithmic improvement over uh, assorted arrays. So let's, uh, let's see if that pans out. And well, it's pretty impressive compared to an n ordered set. Uh, it's about two and a half times faster in the worst case. And then as we go to larger and larger element sizes, we reach a, a point where, where the n ordered set and the sorted array goes off in, into a distance. And then we really reap the benefits of this more complicated algorithm. But at the beginning, for small sizes, there is this, still this huge gap between what we got with the red black tree implementation and, and what the lowly slow sorted array implementation got us. So how can we close this gap? We aren't able to do any more algorithmic improvements. Uh, the algorithms books we have don't contain anything that's better than red black trees. So the best we can hope for is to push this line a little bit down uh, the chart. How do we do that? Well, if you look at how insertion is done in this purely functional world, uh, what we do is that when we find the place where we insert a new element, we create a new node for it. But then we cannot just link it directly into our existing tree. We have to create a brand new tree for it. So we go upwards, like in Drew's presentation, and uh, just copy nodes and set values whenever uh, we need them. So in this case, we are doing three allocations uh, so far. And, but then there is this assignment, uh, self-assignment in the insert and the mutating insert method that switches over to the new tree and discards the old one. If there, is, there are no more reference to it, it gets deleted and deinitialized, deallocated, and it takes all the old nodes uh, with it. So we have three allocations and three deallocations, not to mention all the reference count operations that we uh, also need to do. So that's kind of pricey. It's an expensive thing to do, the, all these allocations, the allocs. Uh, what if we could just you know, do the natural thing and modify the tree in place like this? Uh, that's OK, but this goes beyond what value types are supposed to do, because they aren't supposed to change themselves. They are fixed in place. Uh, we shouldn't be able to just mutate them like this, except if we are only the only ones that hold a reference to this value, we can cheat and just modify it in place because nobody will know. Nobody else holds a copy of it. Okay? And this is a very important operation in these kinds of purely functional data structures. It is called uh, COW. It's actually an acronym uh, for copy on write, which is what it, this is called. Okay? So copy on write means that we only copy data when we want to make modifications on a value that is shared uh, with others. Right? We don't want to change them behind their backs. All right, so how do we do that? We have a standard library function to determine if a reference is unique to us. Uh, if it returns false, it means that that reference has other, well, that target of that reference has other references. Uh, uh, not, uh, it's not just ours to modify to our heart's contents. The problem is that this function takes classes, cl instances of classes, not enum values. So we have to rewrite everything uh, to structs and classes. All right, so we are going to do that. Here, here is the code, kind of boring and complicated, lots of assignments inside it. Uh, once again, we are going to take the balancing calls out and let's see what happens. So this was the original balancing method, very elegant, kind of nice. And this is what it turns into. It's really horrible, a bunch of if statements, really complicated assignments inside of it. Kind of scary because we have to maintain this now. Uh, but is this all worth it? Uh, well, let's take a look. Wow, apparently it is. We got another four and a half times improvement over our previous thing. This was kind of a complicated optimization step, but it really paid off. Okay, is this enough? Well, almost. There's still a little bit of performance gap between the initial cases of sorted array and this uh, improved copy on write red black tree implementation. Uh, but how the hell will actually close that gap? Oh, I don't know. Let's take a closer look at what sorted array is actually doing. Okay, so here's the curve. Uh, if you look at it, it seems to have two parts. 
at the end, we get the expected linear growth rate. Okay, this is what we expect from sorted array implementation. But in the beginning, it looks like the time it takes to insert a new element doesn't actually depend on the size of the array. That's remarkable. That's uh, unexpected. How could that be? Well, let's take a look at where this division line is. It's about 4,000 elements or so. And 4,000 integers, each of which take 8 bytes of storage, uh, that makes about 32 kilobytes, which is a special number because on the system I was running the benchmarks on, that's the same size of the level 1 cache of the CPU. And I don't think it's a coincidence. So apparently, if you have a really small sorted array, it is super fast. So why not just use really small sorted arrays to store our elements? Let's do that. Let's start with just one array, a really tiny one, so we, it has space to store more elements in it. Let's see, fill it up. Now we have reached the cache size of our CPU, so we have to do something because we cannot just keep increasing this array. What do we do? Well, we just split it in half, extracting the middle element from there just to find our way. And now we have a two-level data structure with two uh, halves of the original array in there. We can keep inserting more and more elements into these two halves until one of them becomes full again, in which case we do another split. There we go. Wow. But now we have two separators. What are we going to do with those? Well, a trivial case, we want to store elements inside the sorted array, so let's just shove them together into one. Okay? Now we have four sorted arrays, and we can keep going, adding more and more elements until the second level structure becomes too large. But what do we do then? We just split it up and we have another level. Okay, so we have just invented a really cool new data structure, but unfortunately, uh, this is 45 years old this year. It's, it's called B-trees. Okay? Uh, if we implement this, uh, we could start with you know, a struct that holds a root node, very simple. And then we have to define the nodes themselves. In, the most natural thing to do is to use a sorted array for storing the element values and use another array to store the children references. OK, but to help out the compiler a little bit, we are going to inline the sorted array implementation directly into our B3 code. Uh, but we won't stop there, because array is also a struct implemented in a standard library, so we can just go ahead and inline the methods of it uh, di directly into the B3 code. That makes things a little bit more complicated. Uh, so we end up with an insertion method that looks something like this. Uh, but it's still too, not too complicated. It's about 100 lines of code, really compact compared to some other languages. So what did we achieve? Did we close that gap? Uh, thankfully, we did. Uh, we have reached and or exceeded sorted array performance on the entire size spectrum. And this is probably the fastest way we, there is to implement an ordered set on this kind of hardware. All right? That's pretty cool. So what did we do? Uh, we started with a really simple solution by just reusing an existing collection. And then we iter iterated on this solution, trying to implement a much more complicated algorithm with better char characteristics. Initially, with the easiest way there is, which is to do functional programming. And then we rewrote it in an imperative style to have the copy on write optimization ready. And then at the end, we incorporated the uh, aspects of hardware we are running on. And we also inlined a bunch of methods from the standard library and other, other collection types. But you know, once that's done, somebody has written all of this, uh, we can just use the initial very simple thing, reusing an existing collection. And as it happens, I do have an implementation of B3s ready to go. Uh, check it out on GitHub and help me out with optimizing it if you have some free time and want to have some fun code to work with. All right, uh, just as a final thing, uh, there are some real-world numbers, not lo on a logarithmic scale, but on a natural linear scale. So inserting 3 million values into every one of these data structures, we see that sorted array actually takes longer than this entire talk, hopefully. But B3 actually finishes in considerably less time than I need to say thank you for listening. And uh, please check out my code on GitHub and follow me on Twitter. <laughs>